This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show, and this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, I am a co-producer on 13 Fanboy, and I'm very proud of it, you know. And uh, I have another one of the Fanboy alumni here on the phone with me. Somebody is kind of similar to me, comes from a very regular background, and like myself, he's it hasn't hit him yet that he's involved <laughs> with all, all these projects, but uh, like myself, he enjoys it. Folks, I have on the phone with me Jason Bradford. How you do, Jason? Hello, I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me here. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> as I've said uh, in your introduction, uh, <laughs> this is all pretty um, interesting for you as well, huh? It is. This whole experience has been incredible, um, and you're my first interview. <laughs> I'm happy to be your first interview. Yeah. Yes. Very exciting. Yes. So, uh, before I get to uh, 13 Fanboy, give us a little bit of your background and how you got to here, where we are now. Well, I think it all started with Christopher Lee and Hammer Films, you know, the 60s, 70s. Um, I, I just remember curling up on the couch with my mother and my sister and, and watching all these classic films um, and just being being enthralled by it and uh, pretty much instantly obsessed at a very young age. Um, and that would grow. I remember watching Trilogy of Terror with Karen Black and mm-hmm. um, Salem's Lot. My, my sister was a big influence on that, too. Uh, she, she tried to scare the shit out of me in real life often, as often <laughs> as she could. So... It's, horror has always been a big part of my life, and in my teenage years, it was it, it was almost like a friend and companion that it was just keep me company when there's nothing to do. You know, you know? Well, do you remember the first horror film you ever seen? Uh, I don't remember the very first one. I think it was um, Brides of Dracula. Okay. Uh, again, the, the Hammer film, and I just remember, I don't remember the actress's name, I but I remember thinking, man, she's beautiful, and I was so worried about her was she going to be killed would she be okay and and it was just i was on the edge of my feet and biting my nails and i remember bugging my mother is she going to be okay will she be okay and that it was just that that fear and the suspense it's just it's something that you don't get with any other genre i've interviewed a couple of the hammer film actresses i've had caroline monroe on here and i've had veronica carlson on here yeah yeah both lovely yep carolyn monroe was in uh dracula uh, AD, I think it was 1972 AD, was mm-hmm. that the name of the title, I believe? Yeah. Which I found that one interesting because it takes place on the day I was born. September 18th, 1972 was the day that movie took place. And I was always. Oh, you kidding me? You're just a couple yeah, months was, uh, younger than me. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was born July 8th, 1972. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. It was a good year to be born. Yeah, the year that Fritz the Cat, Pink Flamingos, uh, yeah. <laughs> Last Tango in Paris. <laughs> yes, yes. That was a great year. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> How did you get interested in Friday the 13th? I uh, remember my mother and my aunt when I was 10 years old. Friday the 13th Part 2 was the first one that I saw. Same here. It was on television. Um, I believe it was edited down pretty heavily. Uh, but my mother and my aunt were painting the house and i was just staying all the way and i was i saw this uh this movie part two and i just remembered it scared this shit. language okay to be freely used go ahead <laughs> it scared the shit out of me mm-hmm. um and again it was more intense than anything i had ever seen it was the first horror movie that i saw that i i couldn't stand to watch it i was watching it through closed fingers i was changing the channel anything i could do to get away from it but yet i was so so enamored by it that I couldn't keep from going back to it. So I, I watched the whole thing. Um, that was when I fell in love with Amy Steele, um, March Cover, every everybody in part two. I had a long standing crush on Lauren Marie Taylor. <laughs> yeah, you and many um, others. <laughs> but you know that movie was was so frightening to me. It had such an impact on me that to this day, when I smell paint, um, interior house paint, I can't not think of Friday the 13th part two and the very first time I watched it it's just it's related to that smell for me now forever okay 
Why that smell? That's how, that's how powerful it was. I'm sorry, what was the question? Why that smell? Because they were painting the house the first time I saw that movie. Oh, okay. And that that smell was in the house the first time I watched that movie. So it's like a a memory, a sensory memory kind of thing. Well, Kirsten Baker was my the first time I seen a nude woman. So that was my experience. Yeah. For that. <laughs> yes, yes, in good form. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I I can't say I was disappointed. <laughs> I know Russell Todd's been on the show, and he said that she would love to hear that story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Russell Todd was awesome. I think a lot of people think Mark's character was the iconic death of part two, but I there's something about Scott hanging upside down that tree. I mean, they were both helpless, one, one being in a wheelchair and one being tied up and not being able to go anywhere, so they are both pretty brutal in that aspect. For me, the, for part two, it was the shish kebab scene in the bed. Yes. Oh, that was... The scene was butchered by the NPAA. They had to get rid of so much of that stuff, and it's a shame that only only images of the uh, of photo images remain. Now the actual footage that was shot was lost, which is, which is a real shame. You know, I was talking to somebody recently that said, you know, they might say that footage is lost, but a lot of people say it exists out there somewhere. It's just a matter of finding it. So. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so. Because I know part seven was heavily butchered by the M. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I think most of them were. I think part four was very lucky um, that it gave us what it gave us. Because I remember part four when the final chapter came out and I watched it, I thought, wow, this is really brutal and bloody compared to the other ones. Mm-hmm. Um, but even I believe it was Tom Savini even said that they cut back and allow the kills to give us more of a machete in the head with Jason at the end. Okay. So, but it seemed like every death in Part Four gave more than the other films did, up until Part Nine when Jason went to hell with Debbie in the tent scene. That that's kind of the iconic death scene out of all of them. Yeah. Well, here's the thing with Part Four though. Um, mm-hmm. it, every death scene in it seemed to be unique too, you know, yeah. like I noticed with part seven, I got really bored with a lot of the death scenes. Like you got the yeah. iconic sleeping bag death scene, but you got a lot of like the guy by the refrigerator just gets stabbed, you know, and it's like yeah, it was, stuff like that was just boring. Purpose. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I think Robin's character, I think was, um, a, 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 one of my least favorite deaths in the franchise. Oh, was she still? When, uh, just uh, when Jason just threw her off the window and then she hit the ground. It's like the, the, her impact didn't look like it would hurt the child. And there was no glass that landed behind her when she got thrown through a window and that the whole editing and that that scene just that that was to me the my least favorite death in the franchise. Oh, gee, I don't know what my least favorite death is, but but um... <laughs> execution wise, I should say, and editing, I should say. Yeah. Theory wise. Otherwise, it's, it's one which tied that one tied back to part four because it was shot in the same bedroom as the final chapter. Yes. Um, do you have a favorite of the franchise? Uh, yes, part three is my favorite, hands down. I love the cast, the setting, the kills, the music. You got your disco music, um, <laughs> which the opening credit, which also plays once more when Shelly and Vera are in the, the store uh, with this Fox and Loco and Ali. Mm hmm. So, but part three is my favorite. Um, it has Tracy Savage in there, who's one of my favorites, and Catherine Parks, who's one of my favorites. And, of course, you've got Dana Kimmel. I mean, these three girls, and it's just the whole atmosphere of part three. And it's like you would be able to go and hang out with any group of, of these characters as friends for a day. It's like I'd want to hang out with those those characters the most. I'd want to hang out with Tracy Savage. <laughs> exactly. Big exactly, crush yes. on Tracy yes. Savage. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I would have made her the survivor of that movie. It kind of irks me that they didn't, because she was the only one that didn't uh, narc on um, on Shelley, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's yeah. True. Now, I, I do have to defend Vera, and here a lot of people call Vera a bitch because of the way she treated Shelley, but I think she handled herself really well for somebody who didn't want to be involved with someone. You know, she was... Patient and kind, and she, I don't think she was too mean to her. I never saw Vera as a bitch. I think she stood her ground, and she, she knows what she likes, and she's got enough self-respect not to be honest. So uh, Vera, Vera's my favorite. Yeah. Well, for me, I think my favorite might be the final chapter. 
Yeah, I like that. Yeah, Teb White. On there too. Teb White's my favorite Jason out of the bunch. Yes, he was, he was fantastic. Yeah, I love. I like the scene he put behind Jason. Yeah. Yeah. Originally, they wanted him to do the whole Frankenstein walk, and he didn't think that made any sense. You know, and yeah. he was asked uh, during shooting, "Why is he running?" And he said, "Because he wants to catch the girl." I think it was. <laughs> uh, I think it was Frank Mancuso Jr. I think he said that liked the running, and I think it added more suspense. Like when. Oh, absolutely. When yeah. Kimberly Beck is faced with him there at the upstairs of that that house there and it's yeah. just her yeah. and she's got Jason on, in front of her and she's got the window behind her. It's like, what's yeah. she going to do? She has There's... to survive because you get a kid, Corey Feldman that she has to protect. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I love yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that too. That was great. I remember the first time I watched that scene um, when he was running after her, I was, it, it definitely made, made your hair, you know, you just got into it so much. It was a white knuckle scene. You're on the edge of your seat. You know, yeah. you're just yelling at the screen. The run, you know, because you didn't expect that. You know, Richard Broker is, is also my favorite version of Jason. Um, the, with the, the, the stalking, ominous presence that he brought with Jason. But I love Ted White with the the power that he brought to Jason and the the fury behind the movement made him more intense. Now, in contrast. In Jason mm -hmm. Takes Manhattan, you get the guy that climbs up that thing. Jason's yes. looking up. He's climbing. Yes. Suddenly, Jason's grabs his shoulder and hurt, heals him off there. And I'm like, really? He just <laughs> got up there that fast? Yeah, that's always bothered me, too. It was like, was there some kind of a teleportation thing involved in that? It, yeah, that that was that one made no sense to me either. <laughs> no. That, that's probably one of my, on the top of my list of least favorite deaths you know and only in the whole world, horror world can a fan say they love seeing these people get killed because <laughs> anywhere else we would sound like lunatics but but you're you're right that one has always bothered me as well just the speed of jason it just made no sense yeah yeah so uh and then there's uh always a situation in part five that I I don't know. Danny Steinman, I think, was one of the worst directors of the franchise because you think so. Yeah, because you and I talked to Melanie Kenneman about this, and she she knows just how stupid this looks. She runs, she slips in the puddle, and she's crawling along the ground. Um, Jay, uh, Roy, I guess, is walking after, her, and mm -hmm. you know, finally he catches up to her. Now, he. Uh, you see her screaming face, the machete rays, her screaming face, the machete rays, the screaming uh -huh. face, the machete rays. And finally, <laughs> right. you know, a Reggie the Reckless bursts out through the burn door with the, with the bat or the backhoe there, the bulldozer, excuse me. And it's, it's kind of like, here's how you're supposed to do it. Yeah. Cut to the machete raising her screaming face, then the bulldozer coming out. That's how you do it. Right. Not back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That was so <laughs> stupid. And even Melanie knows how stupid that was. But what, what can she do, you know? Maybe Roy's hesitation balances Jason's stealthiness from part eight. Maybe that balances it out. <laughs> oh, I don't know. But yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. It, 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 you know, it might, maybe it had something to do with her wearing uh, that very thin white material in the Pouring rain. Maybe they're just giving the the audience numbers who enjoy that kind of thing, that visual for that you know that extra second of screen time. Yeah, she wasn't too <laughs> pleased with that either. No, oh, and probably horrible to shoot too in that cold cold rain. It was probably miserable. I know Kimberly Beck said that filming her scenes in the rain was miserable. Yeah, but um, another one of my favorites, of course, is the nudeless Jason Lives. But you know. That movie was so well put together, you know, and I think Tom McLaughlin, I'd like to see him direct another one. And I know after the stupid lawsuit gets done, he's got a script yeah. already. Yeah. 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 You know, Jason Lives um, actually has overall, um, it's my favorite in, in two aspects. One, it's the most visually stunning Friday the 13th. The shots are beautiful, the lighting and the shadows. It's pretty much eye candy to the horror fan. It's it's just beautiful to look at. If you watch it with mute, it's beautiful no matter pretty much where you where you stop it. So mm -hmm. whoever did the set designing and the cinematography and that was spot on. My second favorite thing about Jason Lives um, is it has some of the most unique deaths, mm -hmm. most of which didn't even have blood involved. 
um, when Sissy got pulled through the window and her head getting getting wrenched off and the chair of Garris, you know, those are some of my favorites. And when Paula's checking on the kids and she's walking over that open glass window, I know it's a huge window in real life. You're going to see someone on the other side, but her being oblivious to that, Jason literally walking with her, knowing she could turn and see him any minute, him not giving a shit, just following her like a shadow, watching her, that slow pan of the camera. That to me was one of the creepiest scenes of any installment. It just, that, that gives me chills when I watch that scene. How weird is it that Paula, played by Carrie Noonan, was killed off in the movie, and she's the good girl. She was the good girl. She, yes, yeah, she had she had absolutely none of the 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 victim stereotypes that horror films have become legendary for. Yes, absolutely. And why was Jason so mad at her <laughs> that he had to paint the entire cabin and ruin a good bowl of popcorn to get rid of her? <laughs> yeah, I always felt bad for her death scene. You know. So. Yeah, you know he had to he had to take his time with that one. Yeah, but no, and of course, with the the found, uh, how technology has come, Never Hike Alone, I thought, was better than some of the installments. I have Never Hike Alone on Blu-ray, and it's sitting on my my um, Blu-ray shelf right next to my Friday the 13th franchise, yep. because that's, that's exactly where it belongs. It, there are some installments that that looks better. It's It's looks better than a studio made picture to me. The, the only thing I wish was that it was feature length. Yeah. Other than, that, other than that, I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, I thought it was better than Jason X. <laughs> Jason X is good for entertainment purpose only. <laughs> I call Jason X the room of the franchise. <laughs> it's the birdemic of the franchise. It's, it's definitely out there, yeah. It's definitely out there. I guess when you think about it, though, the, the good thing is, is that it hasn't actually happened yet in real time. We've still got a few hundred years to go, so we don't have to worry about that. We can just write that one off and not even watch it. <laughs> Jason X is my least favorite of the franchise. I think it's actually the worst. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say was the worst? I have to agree with you. I think Jason X is probably probably one of the worst for me too um and you know and it, it's it shows how much i love the entire franchise i've seen i've seen jason x the movie theater when it came out twice and i've watched it probably a dozen times since i will say i love km km is one of my favorite characters in the oh franchise. yeah but other but other than that i think it was kind of i mean i can see where they're trying to be creative but it just it didn't have the feel and formula of, of the other ones what do you think of this lawsuit situation? I've had Victor Miller on the show, and I think he's a really mm-hmm. nice guy. I, yes. I think Victor Miller is a stand-up guy. I stand behind Victor Miller, and I really hope this works out for him. I know a lot of the fans of the movies and the games have been been complaining about this lawsuit, but I think he's entitled to what he's fighting for, and I hope he gets it. Yeah. And I know it may take us a long time to get another installment or any advances in games or any new NECA figures or all, you know, all that, all the franchise stuff. But, you know, you got to think, if it weren't for Victor Miller, we wouldn't have these characters and games and, and NECA action figures that we're wanting in the first place. So I think yeah. he's entitled and I hope he gets it. And yeah. I haven't met Cunningham in person, but from what I've heard of, uh, from people who have worked with him and know him, uh, and like I said, I haven't met him, so I can't draw my own conclusions on other on anything else, but he doesn't seem like the type of person who is, very professional and friendly, no. and he's very selfish and greedy from what I hear. Like I said, I've met him, but that's just a lot of people have been saying that. Well, I've interviewed Adam Marcus on here a couple of times, and I'm an associate producer on uh, Hearts of Darkness, the making yes, of the final yeah. Friday. Adam's a stand. He's a stand-up guy. He's 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 amazing. Yeah, I know he was crushed when he fa- when he heard Sean Cunningham. Just say uh, that's a that's a that's a lie about the whole uh, taking off uh, uh, Jason's mask in part nine. Uh, I remember yeah. reading that in Fangoria magazine when it had Jason goes to hell on the cover back in 1993. Mm-hmm. I remember yeah. that quote being and uh, you know and I think Adam Marcus with this uh, documentary he's making. I, I think he needs to defend himself, and uh, it's pretty yeah, sad. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. I know Sean Cunningham directed the first one, and I know his wife edited uh, the uh, second one. But mm-hmm. 
I think it's all about money, and I, I mean, I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, it, yeah. I, I, a lot, I, lot of greed behind. I always, <laughs> I always referred to Cunningham as the George Lucas of the horror world. <laughs> George Lucas. Now, why George Lucas? How many times can you possibly release Star Wars <laughs> and try and capitalize off of it with, with, over and over again? With, I mean, they had so many different versions, and then they added the. The job of the hut CGI, mm -hmm. you know, it was just so he could resell it and resell it. The same movie over and over again, trying to make trying to make as so much money as again. That was what I took from that. Okay, and I didn't realize that. Cunning, was, yeah, you know, I was cunning him and, and you know trying to milk it for every penny he can, and, and it, it just it, his greed. And I'm not trying to talk talk bad about anybody. I mean, he may have his reasons, and you know, I I may not know his story. This is just what I've gathered, what I've seen myself to to compare him to George Lucas. Mm -hmm. Which I'm not saying George Lucas is a bad guy either. And you know, yeah. how many times can really Star Wars try and make profit? <laughs> yeah. Well, that brings us to thirteen fanboy, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah. And um, I I've had Debbie Sue Voorhees on my show four times, and I know yes. the third time she was on, she talked about this project and I don't know whether mm -hmm. I was the first one that she spoke to about it. I know I was up there as one of them and I was one of the early people to mm -hmm. uh, take uh, part in this and uh, I got a co-producer and I, awesome. the moment she mentioned Tracy Savage as part of this, I knew I had to. <laughs> I Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. The first time I talked with Deborah about Deborah's a good friend of mine. She's, she's a, a phenomenal filmmaker a director. Um, the first time I spoke with her, um, so I'm gonna say it's close to two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but she had asked me, you know, who who I think would be good from the franchise in the film if if she were to make a film. So looking back at this conversation, I'm pretty sure this was the early stages of 13 Fanboy. Um, you know, she asked me what kind of mask would be good in the film that do wouldn't uh, be a copyright infringement upon the hockey mask and. You know, if I knew anybody who was good with masks and stuff like that. So um, just joking around, I told her, I said, Deb, if you ever make make a movie uh, about this or any other kind of movie, because she's also got a movie called The List that she was um, talking about quite a bit. So if you ever make a movie with Tracy Savage, I want to be in the scene with her. You know, I was just joking around. Um, and I made it known to Debra from the very beginning. Part 3 is my favorite, and, and Tracy Savage and Catherine Parks are probably two of my favorite people if you could ever get me to see with either of those i'd be i'd be very happy about it so <laughs> and it happened actually kind and of it, kind of for both of us because my picture is in a scene with a tracy yeah, side yeah see that's awesome yeah so that's <laughs> awesome yep so yep. Uh, um and i actually um a friend of mine uh i, I my character name in the, in the film is called is, is troy <laughs> <laughs> and it's Named after Troy Elke, uh, who is who is a friend of mine. He's he's an out, outstanding guy. He's got an amazing sense of humor. Uh, so I was very very honored when I was um, confirmed that I could play uh, the character named Troy because I couldn't think of a better a better character name to be. <laughs> Troy, I was talking to today. Troy's been on my show. I love his theories about Friday yeah. the Thirteenth. Have you heard them? Yeah. I have not, but you know, with the kind of voice that he has, I think he could sell anything. He's definitely got a, an amazing voice. He could do yeah. voiceovers or radio personalities or anything he wanted to do. Well, his theory, and I like his theory, is that the uh -huh. killer the killer in part two is actually Elias, and Jason starts in part three. Oh, okay. Yep. And in a way, it kind of makes sense, because you... It, it could make sense, yeah. Because... I mean, the, the, between part two and three, it's like Jason literally just grew a foot and a half. So it could make sense that Elias was much shorter. Now, how else could he get the eyeball? Well, the uh, um, the the, sorry, the I'm, I'm not... that eyeball uh, that yeah. Abel has. Um, Abel, yeah, he, he and I were talking. He, he and I were talking about that, and we think that was Paul's eyeball. You think it was? Yeah, I I like to think Paul lived. I. I don't, I don't know. So. I know that's one of the big debates, but I think I think he lived. You think so? Yeah, I think so. I think the eyeball was probably Edna's. <laughs> oh. 
Well, that was a theory of his too, but uh, but he said, you know, there's other parts of the body, and I I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. Yeah. I mean, it very well could be Tom. I'm not always right. Maybe he died. <laughs> yep. But that was his theory that um, that uh, that Elias, because in part that's funny because between part two and three, he had time to shave his head, mm-hmm. and he has uh, brand new clothes on, and you would think even mm-hmm. uh, the year before when Chris Higgins has her uh, flashback, you know, he's yeah. dressed the way he is in part three, and you'd think that you should probably remember what her attacker right. looked like. Right. And, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and guess what? At the beginning of part two, could you see Jason finding uh, Alice? I could see probably Elias maybe finding her. Possible. Yep. Not Jason, but Elias. Yeah, the, I think the Elias thing does make sense. Because um, like I said, like you said, the change of clothes and everything. But when he's chasing after Ginny in part two, and she's hiding behind the bush, and she jumps out and kicks him in the crotch, <laughs> he, looks like he's, he looks like he's four feet tall there. He looks shorter than Ginny. Yeah, and then in part three you have this big hulking six foot four menace just staring from the shadows. He's definitely grew a lot between part two and three, you know. And it's like the next day, it's like I, I want to know what he took. I'm only five eight. I would love to sprout up eight inches overnight, whatever he did. Well, here here was Troy's theory, and I loved hearing it. You know, I interviewed him, and I loved hearing it that uh, Elias was abusive. And mm-hmm. he says that Jason was not actually Elias's uh, son. You see, because yeah. he and Tro- Troy's theory is that Roy is not just an ambulance driver. You know mm-hmm. that Roy and Pamela had an affair. Because look at Joey. Joey's got kind of a little bit of a deformity to him as well. He does. You know, and it's funny that that Troy would say that because I actually. Just joking around, I made a family photo with just Tim and Roy mm-hmm. together, like a couple with the wizard of the backdrop. And I've commented before that like, wouldn't it be cool if um, Joey and Jason were related uh, in some in some weird sort of way? Well, Troy so, thinks that uh, um, Roy is actually the real father and had an affair, and that mm-hmm. Elias suspected it and never liked his son. And due uh-huh. to one of his abusive spats, uh, Pamela bashed his head in with a cast yeah. iron uh, frying pan. I now, <laughs> yeah, now she is the one that takes and dumps his body in the lake, uh, Elias, thinking he's dead. Now, while he's half unconscious or whatever, uh, after she bashes his head in, you see, and this ties into part two. She sees Jason, you know, soothing Jason, you know, uh, sweet Jason, you know, blah, blah, blah. Because people always say, well, what about when Jenny um, wears a sweater and confronts him, you know? And uh, this is, uh, so there would be something like that that he saw or heard whenever she was comforting Jason. Mm -hmm. And, of course, and I loved how um, um, Vengeance covered this where Elias in that film uh, pulls Jason ashore after he uh, uh, drowned and um, the whole deadite thing. And I love that, that Jason Goes to Hell made references to Evil Dead and to uh, Creepshow with the crate. And yeah, I didn't catch the crate. You said that was in... Yeah, um, the- even Adam Marcus had said it. I didn't, I catched, I caught the Necronomicon and I, and I thought the whole deadite well, the Nepagonicon thing, that, that that's what brought him back in Jason Lives. Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't Jason Lives? Well, that's uh, the theory of Troy, and even Adam Marcus even agreed with that. Mm. That, that would have been what uh, keyed him uh, uh, back to life, you know? But, yeah. but uh, Troy had some interesting theories in there and that we talked about, you know? and um, Yeah. I thought it was interesting in Vengeance. Did you see Vengeance? I did not see Vengeance. Well, they did a great job at recreating the death of the first two counselors in Part 1. Oh, Claudette in 1950. Yeah, uh, yeah, Claudette and Barry. And according to that film, um, um, Elias killed them. 
Hmm. Yep. Although, to be frank, I would have thought it would have been Pamela. Yeah. That would be an interesting plot, plot twist. Yeah. That could actually that could actually work. Yeah. They've never actually showed Pamela with Claudette and Mary. It could have been technically anyone. Yeah. So, um... You know, the, the first time... I, and here's an interesting fact. I don't know if, if, you, if you've heard this before or not. I'm sure you have. It's pretty common, but the book... Um, the novelization of Jason Lim. Yeah, I know. Was the first chart was the first time Elias was mentioned. Mm-hmm. And the old the old caretaker, the old do they think I'm a fart head? Yeah. Um, who dies from the whiskey bottle in the book? Mm-hmm. He was Jason's father and did not actually get killed in the book. Well, Tom McLaughlin wanted to shoot something like that, but the because st- mm-hmm. he had 13 kills in it. And the studio wanted more kills, and they didn't want Elias yeah. introduced. So the scene where the caretaker and the two on the motorcycle are killed, they were mm-hmm. added after. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, that's 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 cool too. I mean, I it was another Shishka mob scene, kind of Becca, a Justin Sandra, nod. Yeah. So I love uh, Troy's theories, and uh, and um, yeah, he's very creative. Well, here's something else too, like like this. I we talked about the cabin. You got Alice's body back there, you know, and we talked about gee, why is Terry's body back there? Yeah, yes. Well, and according to Troy, he says he believes that uh, that Elias brought that back there for Jason, you know, because Jason attacks Chris Hagen the year before. Yeah, and it looks like a um, not so not so much a attempted murder although she does kick a knife out of his hand but it's very very awkward hmm. so he learned how to hunt and kill from his father hmm. from part two and mm-hmm. yep yeah, and uh he believes that he he uh his last victim would have been paul that took everything out of him to kill paul and then you see him at the beginning of part three pulls the machete out and that's where mm-hmm. he would have died but hmm. so and it, that you know, if part two was remade kind of in the, in the, the same way Back to the Future part two was made, mm-hmm. uh, with those little twists and turns added in there, I think it would totally work. Well, Troy that, wants to write this yeah. out. Yeah, Troy yeah. wants to write this out. He wants to do something with it because he thinks even the the professor from Evil Dead would have been one of the people in one of those cabins. At one point, yeah. you know, yeah. Professor Nobi. Yeah. So it kind of uh, makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. But you anyway. Know, have this crossover with all, you know, even the Friday 13th. It's, it's still a long time coming. We need the Jason versus Ash. Yeah. Get Bruce Campbell back on the screen, Jason Kane Hunter. I would have liked that. I doubt it's going to happen, but I'd love to uh, see I it. I don't happen either. I'd love to keep the comic books for that. Yeah. Have you read? It, watch, have you read the comic books? No, I like to stick to the films. Okay. Uh, I, I I think the closest I've come to reading the comic books of Friday Thirteenth was in Fangoria magazines. Okay. Back when Seven Eleven actually sold them. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and other things too, like Adam Marcus is talking to me about the backstory to Creighton Duke. You know, like mm-hmm. Jason attacked his. Uh, Jason attacked his uh, fiance in 1960. Yeah, that's you know very interesting too. Yeah, I would I would like I, that actually is um, a lot of backstory to Creighton Duke that I think would be be interesting. You know, there's a lot of characters in this franchise that I would love to get more backstory. You know, we only know them for the couple of days that the time period takes place, and then they get killed or they don't get killed, but. Backstories would be would be really interesting. A lot of them, I think, Creighton Duke would would hold up very well. Yes, absolutely. I would actually love some backstory to to Pamela Voorhees. I would love to see, you know, her giving birth to what, you know, she thought was only one child. Obviously, she had two. You know, how did that come about? Because in Friday Thirteenth, she says it, it was her only child. Well, Joey wouldn't nine. be her. Joey's Joey wouldn't be hers. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. In part nine, though, you you got Jessica, but who's his? Oh, that's Elias? right. I didn't think about that. Yeah, because he's got a sister. And I'm thinking that if it's Pam's daughter, 
which may very not well be. Maybe it is Elias, but if it was Pam, did she maybe deliver twins? Well, doesn't she? she doesn't she, she say her only thing. son? Or does you know, she I'm say... going to have to go back and rewatch the original. I got my only child in my head when she was talking to Alice at the end, but she may have said my only son. Maybe she had. I don't know. I don't. It's been I a while to, since I've watched it. I'll have to go back it. and check that. But if she did say my only child, my my theory is that she was pregnant with twins, didn't know it, and she had such a hard birth that they, she may even pass out, and then the second one came out, and Elias may have told the doctor, you know, take that one away, she'd leave her with the mongoloid because that's what she deserves. And maybe yeah. then they just adopted Jessica out. You know, there's some backstories to that too. That would be very interesting. So Adam Marcus definitely opened up a can of what if in the backstories of these characters. Yes, he did. You know, and I'm looking forward to seeing what he does to this with this documentary. So, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, all oh, this documentary, I'm I'm very excited for it. What part? Um, like how? Um, what part are you involved with with uh, Hearts of Darkness? I'm I'm just trying to help promote get the get the word out there. Uh, I've actually, unfortunately, right now I've been banned by Facebook for sharing too much. Um, the Indiegogo campaign for Hearts of Darkness. I shared it 80 times in a matter of a few minutes, and now till 3 a.m. tomorrow morning uh, or 3 3 p.m. tomorrow afternoon, I'm banned from sharing in any horror groups or commenting on anything. Um, but you know, I just I helped assemble a team of people to help promote it. Um, we've got some of his skeleton crew in there. Um, uh, they're doing all, all the, the backbreaking work, and you know, and Adam's just promising this outstanding um, documentary that would be the perfect marriage to his film. And you know, whether you you love Jason Goes to Hell or you hate Jason Goes to Hell, you can't help but um, realize that some of the scenes in Jason Goes to Hell are unbelievably fantastic, and you gotta love them, even if it's just like I mentioned, Debbie in the tent. Mm-hmm. You may hate Jason Goes to Hell, but you're going to love that scene, you know. I can't believe Facebook is so friggin' petty. They, they are. I, I think they're monitoring while they're eating jelly donuts or something, making a mess. I don't know. Yeah. And they're, they're, just not, they're not doing a great job. No. Another thing I'd like to see done, I would love to see um, Jason Takes Manhattan remade the way it was meant to be in new york <laughs> yeah 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 and maybe a little less time on the lazarus let's give us at least 40 minutes in manhattan, manhattan. give us half the runtime in manhattan yep yeah and, yep i would have i would have preferred i'd like that. to see him pick someone up by the throat and just toss him over the empire state building that would be <laughs> you know land where king kong landed that would be pretty cool there you go there you go so that brings us to 13 Fanboy, which I think is uh, Debbie Sue's answer to the lawsuit, you know? Absolutely, it is 100%, yes. Yep. And I love the fact that she recruited the fellows from uh, Never Hike Alone, which is a major pat in the back for that film. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're both phenomenal to yeah. be around. They're, both of them were pretty amazing. Now, you're in... 13 fanboy, but you're involved in other ways too, are you not? I am, yes. Um, I, I, as involved as I can possibly be involved, Deborah's been very generous with a lot of the things she's allowed me to do. Um, I'm co producing along with you. Okay. I'm the director, I'm the director of public relations. Um, okay. I was transpor- transportation while we were in New Mexico filming. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, uh, Production assistant on set for the three weeks we were there. We shot in um, uh, Carrizozo, Andrew Odoso. And um, yeah, a, a, a graphic designer. I'm working on a poster uh, right now. And there's, there's, we did the 13 Fanboy game, and her group where the, the winner would get a digital poster with her face embedded on it. Um, okay. High definition, print, printable to poster size. You know, so I'm, it's, she's really, really let me just jump on and do a lot of things for this film it's been it's been totally unforgettable i mean i told her in a phone conversation i said deb this has been so important to me that my life it's it's like a milestone in my life when i talk about things that happen it will be compared to things before fanboy and things after fanboy yes yeah i'm experiencing that as well (laughs) it, it is it's magic it is i feel really bad that Tom Matthews is no longer in this, you know. 
Yeah, I know a lot of people um, were really thrilled knowing that he was going to be in it. But I can tell you, I can tell you that the film that's going to be made, it's it's still going to be absolutely phenomenal. And um, one of one of the cast members who's been added that wasn't um, known to me until I got on set was Deborah Sullivan. Uh, love her. Wife. Love her. <laughs> yeah, Lo- and she she was such a sweetheart um, on set. And I had watched Secret Santa about a month before. Mm-hmm. Um, we were filming one of Corey Feldman's scenes. I didn't expect to see her. She walked in. She's playing one of the detectives, and she walked in, and she had a costume on, uh, if I remember correctly, and I still recognized her right away. I looked at one of the other crew members, and I said, oh, my God, that's Deborah Sullivan. <laughs> yeah. I was so shocked to see her, and, and I was I was starstruck. You know, I, I didn't really bring myself to talk to her. I was trying to be professional. I was trying to be the production assistant, not the fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a little bit of fanboy in me, I guess. You know, I guess we all do. But so I, that probably inspired the movie on some level. But she, I just broke down and I said, Deborah, I just got to tell you I loved you in, in Secret Santa. I thought that movie was fantastic. And next thing I knew, she asked me if she could take selfie with me. And she was so eloquent and so so easygoing. And she was she was marvelous marvelous person to get to talk to and get to know a little bit yeah i've had her on here twice and uh once with adam and uh, mm-hmm. i loved I her the power couple <laughs> yeah power couple. I, I i love secret santa so um mm-hmm. i just yeah. I, I got it on blu-ray home i had a blast with it but yeah um, i did too that movie is so fun I'll, I'll watch that again this december i'll make that i'll make that a christmas tradition i'll probably watch watch it back to back with the christmas story and then secret santa you know <laughs> it's a contrast in there there you go. What was it like uh, meeting Corey Feldman? Corey Feldman, let me tell you, he was he was an awesome guy to be around. His wife and his son were there. Mm-hmm. They were all very friendly. Um, Courtney was very quiet, but very polite. Um, Corey was very professional. He was um, he was a great person on set. It was great to watch him work. Um, and it's still now, when I say when I can tell people that I've worked with Corey Feldman, it still sounds like a dream. Um, you know, look at Corey Feldman. It just doesn't sound like it's something that should be coming out of my mouth. <laughs> we had a surprise birthday party for him on set, and that was fun. I had a little video of that. Um, he was a he was he was a great guy. He really was. He was short. <laughs> I didn't expect that. <laughs> he very well could have played Jason in part two if the, if the timing were right. <laughs> yeah. And of course, you know, I uh, <laughs> we talked about Tracy Savage, you know, and she's the reason I come on board on this movie. I've had her on yeah, the show yeah. as well. I want you to tell me about meeting her. Well, we were setting up. We, we were the long days. We started very early to set up. Um, we had just gotten the location, and we were, I had come through the front doors, and there was nobody there. It was just Tracy Savage I and mean, for a good few minutes. The world literally stopped. I mean, this is this is Tracy Savage from part three, one my, my number one all time favorite. She was wearing a light colored pantsuit. She was holding a cup of coffee. She had on her sunglasses. She just she was a stunning, stunning woman standing in front of me and I was thought, Don't fuck this up. Don't say something stupid. Don't make an ass out of yourself. Just go up and, you know. So I I went up and just said, hi, my name's Jason. It's nice to meet you. I'm production assistant, you know. And um, she was so friendly. We talked about um, where she got her education in journalism. You know, she went to school here in Ann Arbor, 10 minutes from where I live. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, she, her, if you look at Wikipedia, it said she, she lived, she was born and raised in Ann Arbor. She clarified that for me. Isn't that true? She lives in the, she was born and raised in the thumb of Michigan, not Ann Arbor. Um, you know, and we talked about snow and heat and winter and, and her her garage she was remodeling and you know, it was had a great conversation. It was like this real moment between us and it all of a sudden it wasn't she wasn't Tracy Savage, she was this just this woman I was conversating with and it was a great conversation. And then the magic broke. So one of the other crew member came across, came around the corner and said, Hey Jason, can you give me a hand with something? And just as he was ending my moment with Tracy, Deborah Voorhees came around the other corner and heard him um, ask me for help. 
and she, knowing that I love Tracy Savage, uh, looks at him and says, can you find someone else to help you? And then she looked at me and says, can you show Tracy around and help her with her luggage? And then she looked at me and smiled wryly and winked at me. <laughs> and I knew that she was giving me this gift of being able to spend more time with Tracy. And I loved Deborah for that. That was, you know, out of that moment, the thing that I remember most wasn't talking to, to Tracy. It was that look Deborah gave me saying, you know, it's okay. Go help Tracy. That that was an unbelievable moment right there. And I'll never forget that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I feel blessed. I had Tracy on my show on Boxing Day uh, 2017. And, um, uh... And I always tell her, I said, the one thing I was seeing three D in that movie is not a popping eyeball. It's you. <laughs> <laughs> I just flattered yeah. her. <laughs> yes, and you know, I'm not only anything here. If you if you watch the teaser trailer that was released, you, you know Tracy Savage in the blue bikini in part three. That blue bikini has become iconic. Yeah. That blue bikini has also been cast in Thirteen Fanboy and has a little cameo. <laughs> yep. 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 No, I um, no, I I love Tracy Savage, and uh, like I said, um, uh, happy to be part of this film. And uh, I yeah, know there is, I know there was a still picture that uh, seen her tied to a chair, and mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I blo- will say right now that picture should not have been posted. <laughs> I, I don't, don't know what I don't know whether she posted it or what. Yeah. I, I believe I believe Tracy had posted that to her page. I did go back and double check, and it's been removed since. But you caught a glimpse. You caught a, a magical glimpse of something that 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 was posted on Facebook briefly. But yeah, yeah. All I will say is that all I will say it's a very very intense sequence mm-hmm. uh, of of how that picture came about. Mm-hmm. And I will say that the the um, Tracy. Um, worked with the stunt coordinator and when we were filming part of the sequence of that, mm-hmm. I, I remember they say, when they say quiet on set, they mean quiet on set. I mean, two rooms over a hundred feet over, we had to unplug a very quiet vending machine because the sound mic was picking up the hum of that. Yeah. So the sound in this movie is going to be incredible, but when they say quiet on set, you, you don't even breathe. And Tracy had been working with the stunt coordinator before we started filming. And during one of the takes, it looked so convincing and so dangerous. I thought Tracy had been hurt. And I just remember going <sighs> like that. And I, I mean, I bit my lips. I was going to say, oh, my God, are you okay? I thought she had been hurt. And then Deborah yelled cut, and Tracy just, just beamed this big old smile and said, how was that? And I just wanted to say, way too good. Because <laughs> it literally, literally scared me. I thought she had been hurt. But we have we had a great, great, I almost, I want to say more, choreographed um scenes with with what was going on it was it was really incredible to see well you play a security guard in it talk about that um well i was i was fortunate enough to be able to read the screenplay pretty early on and i remember reading it and thinking and the security guard was literally like one or two sentences in this in the whole screenplay and i just remember thinking wow security guards in the scene with tracy it would be so cool to play the security guard. So um, wh- how it came about was um, I knew I was going to be in the film, you know, with the, the whole you go and everything like that. And I was on my way to the, which, by the way, I'm not trying to throw this plug in there, but I'm going to throw a plug in there. Indiegogo campaign is still alive, and we're going to be adding new perks. But anyway, I'm on my way one day to my doctor's office. I'm in the parking lot talking to Deborah, and she said, how would you like to play the security guard? And the first thing I thought was Trace Savage. So I played the security guard. So so we got the costume together. I got my name badge with, with the you know, the name of my character on there. It was I mean, I, I was decked out from head to toe in this I my work ran an article on me, um, for being in thirteen fanboy and they couldn't even use my my costume photos, like a fitting photo to see how the character looked because I said I said I looked too much like one of my hospital security guards, so I took that as a great compliment. <laughs> but we filmed my we filmed my thing. We we filmed with Tracy all that day. I knew it was a sixteen hour um, shoot day. We went to my location and filmed my scene um, for. Uh, it, was, it wasn't nearly as long as that. It was only a couple hours. We did it in, I believe, five takes. Mm-hmm. I can't say how I died, but I will say, um, 
I was covered in blood. <laughs> uh, and and then after my scene was finished, um, I, like I said, it had been a really long day. I hadn't eaten since lunch. I was very hungry. So I thought, you know, I'm going to stop me something to eat. So I didn't want to go to the cabin I was sitting in to shower and go back out. So I we stopped at Demi's. I went in dressed as a bloody security guard, and I ordered dinner, and I ate dinner with my bloody costume on, and then we went to uh, ice cream after that. <laughs> and I, everyone was just staring at me because here I am covered in blood just eating an ice cream cone like it was nothing. So that that was fun. It was really fun. I, it kind of takes me back to remember, I remember, um, I believe it was Warrington Gillette, was mm-hmm. it? Yeah. Um, he was injured in filming part two. I think Amy had brought the machete to, or the the machete's out on his hand, and he went to the hospital dressed as Jason. And I and I kind of I had that in the back of my of my mind when we were walking into these places. It was like other actors from the franchise from Friday the Thirteenth franchise can do it. I guess I should do it too. So it was it was it was a fun day. I have a lot of photos. Nora Hewitt was amazing. Um, she was a very very funny and. And Deborah was there, and, and her husband Rich was there, and you know the the entire crew, the cameramen, the grip, the lighting, everything. This team that she's assembled is just so awesome to be around and to learn so many experiences from each one of them. It was just, I mean, like I said, it was a dream come true. Well, you had a similar meetup with uh, Judy Aronson as well. I did. I did. Talk yes. about that. It was the day after I met Tracy. Mm-hmm. Um, it was also in the very same place where I had met Tracy, that, that same location where we were filming with Tracy. Um, mm-hmm. it, I was working with, um, I believe it was Pam. She was uh, one of the production coordinators. Uh, no, it wasn't Pam. I'm sorry. Um, Pam, Pam went to pick Judy up. I was working with somebody else. But anyway, um, I looked out the glass door and here comes Judy. Um, getting out of the car and grabbing the suitcases and you know it's the same thing when I saw Tracy oh my god Tracy it was the same thing right now oh my god it's Judy and I, I put my brave hat on again don't be an asshole don't say something that's going to be stupid you know mm-hmm. so I was just like trying to hold it together and Judy walks in I walk up to her and I say hi Judy I'm Jason and she it stopped right there and she looked at me and she said Jason Bradford it's so nice to finally be able to meet you and I was like she knows me <laughs> and she thought it was nice to finally be able to meet me. And how awesome is that? It was almost like that Deborah Sullivan moment where she had to take my picture, you know, it was surreal and, and, and dreamlike. And I was like, I've been watching these movies my whole life and I'm meeting these actors that I've known of all this time. And it's like, now they know me. And then, and then I can't still to this day wrap my head around that. Yeah. I, I've been unable to get Judy on the show. I remember I mm-hmm. interviewed Ted White twice. And yeah. uh, the first time I interviewed him was 2016. And and um, he actually he gave me the numbers for Judy and for Kane Hodder. Uh, he didn't mm-hmm. do it over the air. but um, And I didn't make any contact with them right away um, because I didn't want to freak them out. But... Right. Um, I remember, you know, uh, in the January this year, we lost Dick Miller. And the only yeah, thing that went through my head is five months prior, I had Dick Miller on my show. And it was like, wow, I, I, was, I just felt blessed that I had Dick Miller on my show before he had passed away. And it was like, if I hadn't have reached out, I would have never made that happen. So... Yeah, so, so I, you did. That's awesome. Yeah, so I reached out to uh, Judy a couple times, and and I never got her. It, it was mm-hmm. uh, either another person or whatever. Kane, I got the answering machine, left a message of what I wanted, and left at that. And I interviewed uh, Debbie Sue for a fourth time, and she requested I lose the numbers. So I uh, honored that, but... Um, so it's kind of like, yeah, I, I'm kind of done reaching out to Judy Aronson, you know? Oh, yeah, it's a shame. She was she was so charming in person. Well, that's what Teb yeah. White said, too. But, yeah, you she know, really, she really was. I know she's read my thing on Facebook where I reached out to her. I even told her, I mm-hmm. said, contact Teb White, ask about me. He's been on the show twice, you know? And yeah. he, he remembered me even the second time I contacted him, and that was three years later. But yeah, it's like, you know... 
if you don't want to do the show, just tell me. So, yeah. Well, hopefully one day it'll happen. You know, hopefully it won't take too much effort. But she was she was very charming, and I think if if you were able to, ever able to get her, hopefully one day she'll say, yeah, I think she would give uh, a pretty pretty great interview. I hope it works that you get to talk to her someday. Well, whatever reason, whatever the reason that it hasn't happened yet, hopefully those will be put aside, and if it happens, it'll be great. It'd be nice, but I I doubt I'll reach out to her again. Like I'm not even going to go yeah. to the premiere, so I'm not, I'm not even going to see yeah. her there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But um, but no, I felt bad about about that. Now Kane, I I don't feel as bad about because I just made made the one uh, message on his thing. But even Mike Aloisi, who is uh, interviewed him for his books and stuff, and is piled around with him. Even Mike said Kane's really busy and this and that. So, you know, I. That's fine, and but um, yeah. I know that uh, Kane's scenes have been shot along with Jennifer yeah. Bonko. Were you there for those? I was. I was there for part of those. Um, I was there for for Jennifer's scene, and um, I was there with Kane Hodder. But I did uh, an airport when I did transportation uh, as well, and I was driving to Albuquerque, which was a seven hour round trip. So a lot of that day shooting, I wasn't there for. But I was. I was there for part of the fight scene that was filmed. Um, I was downstairs. Uh, it's, it, it sounded like they're going to come through the through the roof um, from the downstairs floor. That was it sounded very intense. Yeah. Um, and I was there for some of the scenes, and actually was fortunate enough to witness some of the scenes that Jennifer Banco was uh, filming. And um, again, there's so many spoilers that I wish I could talk about. That That's I all right. Don't inform. don't don't spoil I'm contra- them. <laughs> no, I, I'm not. I'm, I'm contractually sworn to confidentiality, but I will say. The film, the scenes with Jennifer Banco again, like with Tracy, they were so intense, and and her acting was so, so phenomenal. It's like you you're watching these performances, and you're thinking, how do they do that? Because it looks so real, and you, you know, if you're if you're watching this on set, knowing how it was set up and the preparations and everything, and it scares you like that, what is it going to do to the audience? And, they're going to watch these things and think, you know, it's almost going to look like it, like it's a snuff film or something. That's how, how realistic these performances are. And it was just, and I use the word amazing a lot, but it, that pretty much describes it. It was an amazing experience to see Jennifer act and, you know, to, to eat dinner with Kane Hodder and to get pictures with Kane Hodder and to, to see him walk around. And let me tell you, he wears his black gloves all the time. <laughs> what did uh, so. Kane, Kane eat when you ate with him? Um, what did we have that day? We had spaghetti. I believe it was spaghetti. Um, Becca Rose, who did craft, um, we cooked this dinner, um, I want to say 90% of the time. We had a couple times we had caterers bring it in, but, um, uh, that you may know Becca Rose. She's a friend of Lark Park Lincoln. Um, okay. she was on set. She was also a production assistant as well. And she, she made, I seem to recall spaghetti that night. Um, she's part of the cast too, isn't she? Yeah, she is. She has she has a scene in the movie as well. Okay. You know, thinking back now, when when Judy was walking with him that day, it was Becca that I was with. Okay. Yeah. What well, what was Jennifer Bonko like? You drove her, did you not? I did. Yes, I took her and her father Bruce up from the airport. Um, mm-hmm. They had sent her my picture ahead of time, so they would know what I looked like. And I have her phone number. I was told to call her when I got to the airport. So I was inside by the luggage claims, and I, I called Jennifer, and I'll never forget the way she answered the phone. <laughs> she said, hello, hello, darling. <laughs> I, thought, I thought, how fucking cute is she? <laughs> I haven't even met her, and she's already calling me darling. So, um, so yeah, I her father was, her father was a very upstanding gentleman, too. He was full of conversation and never a dull moment with either of them. Um, the trip back from the airport was a five hour drive. So I got to spend five hours with them. Okay. We stopped at Denny's. We stopped at Denny's. She ordered, um, and I, I took notes of everything. Cause I never wanted to forget any of my experiences. I remember Jennifer ordered like banana pancakes and she had sausage and she, it was a big breakfast. And I don't think she had anything left on her plate when she was done. Uh, <laughs> she, yeah, it was great. We had great conversation she told me the story about her, how her father, and I believe her mother um, may have too, but I know her father, uh, would tell her that she was hatched from an egg found in the sewer. <laughs> <laughs> and she believed it for a long time ago when she was really, really little. So I told her, I said, you know, that would make you a ninja turtle. 
I, I called her Ninja Turtle a few times that night, but she was she was very cute, and I, I loved every minute with her. She was she was very charming. Yeah, I haven't got her on yet, but eventually I'd like to get her on. I, yeah. yeah. Well, when when Deborah had the actors doing the Q and A on her on her group, mm-hmm. Jennifer Benko's Q and A went over ninety minutes. So she's very very easy to talk with, and she loves her time with the fans asking questions. And she was she was like I said, charming doesn't even describe it. She was one of my favorite people um, that I that I met. And which was totally unexpected. And I'm not talking about just the Friday the 13th cast. I'm talking about everyone that was there. It's like I felt this little click with, with Jennifer that I didn't expect. We had a lot in common um, in certain aspects, and then we contrasted each other on other aspects. But even the things that we contrasted on, it seemed like we had this mutual um, agreement at the end on, on how things worked out, you know, like religion and stuff. You know, they, we talked about everything. Um she was and her father, both of them. It was a pleasure to be around both of them. Now, you do have an interesting story about Lar Park Lincoln, who I think mm-hmm. is hysterical. <laughs> yeah. Tell us your yeah. story. Let me use the word for Lar to describe Lar as bubbly. She yeah. was so, so energetic. Um, and the first time I saw her, we were we were filming at the Elegante Hotel. We, we, were, we had the luggage rack filled with equipment. And we came through the front door. I believe it was the grip and another PA uh, coming through the front door. And this woman was standing there. Uh, her hair was up in like a loose, messy bun on top of her head. She was wearing like sweatpants and oversized T-shirt and a cup of coffee and these glasses. <laughs> and I and I first I dismissed her as a hotel staff, <laughs> even though she was dressed like a hotel staff shouldn't be dressed, you know. And uh, I smiled and said hi to her. And she said, so are you my crew? And I still didn't realize that that was Lars Park Lincoln at all. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I said, yes, we're true. I'm Jason. And as I'm saying my name, I look into her eyes for the first time, and she has these beautiful blue piercing eyes looking at me through those glasses. And right away I knew who it was. And I, I reached out and I shook my hand. I didn't act like I didn't recognize her at first. I didn't. I just like, hi, Lars. I guess we're true. Hi, Lars. I'm Jason. So I shook her hand. We went, <clears throat> we went, we unloaded that that load, and then on the way back down, I stopped over and I and I spoke with um, Pam Whitey, who is also um, a production coordinator, and Vanessa Ionti Wright. And we were sitting there, and I went up to them like, "Oh my God, I just shook Lars Park Lincoln's hand. I will never wash his hand again for the rest of the week." When I'm saying that, I didn't realize Laura was right behind me listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I had told Deborah before I came out, my biggest fear is saying stupid in front of one of the talent. And there, it just happened right there with Laura Lincoln. <laughs> well, you have another funny story to share about her that I... <laughs> which, one, which one is that? Well, let's just say oh, she yeah, has... Oh, yes, 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 the Nutella story. Yes. So, <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry. How, how can I forget the Nutella story? I bought this big old bottle of Nutella to take with me months before I even left because I had to make this happen. Mm-hmm. If you go to Lars' Facebook page, she has a video on there of her, I believe it was laying in bed, eating what is now just an empty bottle of Nutella and saying how good it is and how she loves it. And I believe it's something along the lines of she wanted to marry the Nutella guy and hopefully he was at least 45 and straight. And then... <laughs> And then she threw the dog the Nutella jar. She didn't want to waste that. So I bought her the bottle of Nutella. I gave, the last day of shooting, I went up to her just before I was getting ready to leave because I had we drove to New Mexico and we had to drive back to Detroit. So we were just getting ready to leave, and I came up with my hands behind my back, and I said, Laura, I have something I want to give you. And I don't think she even said anything. She kind of just looked at me with like big eyes like she was expecting this grand surprise. And I whipped out this bottle of Nutella, and I held it in front of her, and she responded like a, an old Christopher Lee vampire um, repelling the crucifix. She, like, threw her hands up and, oh, no, 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 get that away from me. And, and I held it out even further, and I came closer to her. I said, no, I bought this for you, and I'm not leaving until you take it. So she took it, and then she did a complete 180. She held it up under her chin, and she squealed this big, <laughs> wonderful joy of, you know, squeal of happiness and joy, and she she squeezed the Nutella jar and she hugged it real close, and and 
it, it was just a great moment. That was my favorite LAR moment. <laughs> I can so see that. All, you, all your listeners out there, LAR loves Nutella. <laughs> I just have taken that. Never meet her, take her a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Lar, Lar Perkling. I've had her on the show as well. I've had a lot of these people on the show before. Um, you also Haley Greenbauer is in this. Yes. Uh, you've had an interesting story you shared with me about her. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was very, very fortunate. Uh, Haley was one of the talent that I picked up from the airport. She's mm-hmm. our She's our leading lady um, mm-hmm. right next to Dee Wallace. And I picked her up from the airport. So we had a really nice conversation. We went to this restaurant um, called Vinaigrette. We both ordered uh, cherry tart salad. Uh, if you're ever in um, New Mexico, New Mexico uh, near the airport, try Vinaigrette. So anyway, we're driving back. We're talking. She's, she's a fantastic woman, very down to earth, hugely talented. Uh, Deb couldn't cast a better person for this role. But one day on set, it was a closed set. Uh, we were sitting in the opposite room, and someone comes out and says to me, um, Haley wants to know if she would go get a bottle of wine. And I said, oh, Haley's such a big star now. She has to send you out to ask me. She's 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 about to come out and ask me what herself. And I was totally, I was just kidding, because that was the camaraderie that we had on set. We were able to fool around with each other like that. Mm-hmm. And she goes, I'll go tell her you said that. <laughs> she goes she goes to the close I close the door and a few minutes later Haley comes out you know uh, she's her hair is flowing she's looking beautiful um, and she's got this diva-esque walk it's like this isn't Haley it's this Haley in character mm-hmm. playing around yeah and she's like you know I would have went myself but I couldn't do it and I know the town this town closes at 10 30 the town closes early around here and uh, and she started flipping her hair over her shoulders, and, you know, she was just totally just diva out on me, and it was it was really funny, and I was fortunate enough to get that on video, which maybe one of these days I'll release it to the public, but for now, it's, it's just something I get to laugh at, but she was she was just so cute, and, and so friendly, and like I said, just massively talented, um, when she was, when she was filming her scenes, she was just, it's like she was in acting. It's like she was just living that moment, and that's what was actually happening. And she just taught me what it's like to be natural. And she was. She was just so natural and, and perfect. I'm going to be reaching out to her uh, probably for mm-hmm. later December, you know. So, uh, yeah. Yep. you know, yeah, she she was great. And on the way back from the Albuquerque airport, I had actually mentioned to, to Haley, too. I said, I, I predict that once Fanboy is released, you, you will be – the new Adrian King and Heather Langenkamp, um, as far as Final Girls go, that you're going to be that cult status. Um, and she goes, you think so? <laughs> you know, being very humble, like like that hadn't occurred to her. Which I don't see how it couldn't, because 13 fanboys going to be huge, <laughs> you know? And, and yeah, she's, I think she is going to be the next Adrian King, as far as followers and iconic status goes. Now, of course, Vincent DeSante and... Uh... Uh, Andrew La- Lady, uh, mm-hmm. are both on this as well. Did you get to uh, yeah. work with them? I did. Mm-hmm. I did. Um, actually, <laughs> let me tell you, Andrew Lady is a clown. He <laughs> is. He is super funny. Mm-hmm. He's a very funny guy. I know he's eye candy. He's he's a very good looking guy. And and I know women and even men, straight men, would even look at him and say, "Oh, he's he's like perfect." He came out um, what during one one set. We, had, we were between takes, and he came out, and he was just wearing a pair of, I can't remember if it was sweatpants or pants, but he was shirtless. And he, he I hear him say, hey, Jason. And then, and I turn around, and he's putting sticky, googly eyes on his nipples. <laughs> <laughs> because googly eyes were all the rage on the sets of the 13 fanboy shoot. So he turns around with these googly eyes on his nipples, and he, and he poses, like, seductively with these googly-eyed nipples. He says, take a picture. <laughs> So those pictures also exist in my in my files, which maybe I'll I'll share those too with um, with with the uh, uh, fans of the movie once it's released. But it was funny. So like what, Mary, how Mary, else does never uh, once answered like he was as good looking as he was or as easy as. Well, uh, I only asked that question about Tracy Savage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but well, how else does googly eyes come into play in this? We we have we have a. Uh, 
so many photos taken on the set with googly eyes. If it was, any, there's even a we had we're at a really rich hotel, and there was a gold life size horse in the lobby. And somebody, I don't know who it was, they put big old googly eyes on that horse too. <laughs> everywhere you looked, there was googly eyes everywhere. <laughs> and it, it kind of stuck with us, um, even to this day now, when we go places in our own in our own world, in our own lives, back home where we are now, we'll, we'll buy googly eyes and we'll stick them on something, and then we'll send each other the picture of the googly eyes. We call it the googly eye bandit. Whoever you know, whoever sent the picture of it, it's the googly eye bandit strikes again. There may even be a hashtag for it. The hashtag googly eye bandit strikes again. But yeah, it was it was a fun it was a fun little thing on the set, on the side. <laughs> Okay. Now, uh, <laughs> how much filming is left on this movie? You know, I don't know exactly. We filmed for three weeks the first set. Mm-hmm. Um, the second set, I believe, and I could be wrong on this, don't quote me, but I believe they said there's 40 more days, but that's what total, I believe, that could be with, you know, like filming in the days off and then a little break in between. I believe I believe there's 40. I know Deborah said she wants to have this released before the end of 2020. Okay, yeah. So I know I know that um, they've got a good third, if not half of it, already filmed. So. Okay. You work with C.J. Graham. I would ask I would ask I would ask Deborah that if you get to interview her again, I think she'd give you a more precise answer. Okay. Did you, did you work with C.J. Graham? I did not. Um, that would have been a great honor to have been able to work with him. Um, I know he's, he's like people's choice for, choice for one of the best Jasons overall. Um, uh, he's he's a very friendly guy from what I could see of him with his interviews and stuff, but I unfortunately I didn't get to meet him, and I won't be back for the next Lego filming, so I won't get to get to be on set to meet him and D and Ron Sloan. Ron Sloan is is a true gentleman too. I would love to meet him someday. I've interviewed uh, Ron Sloan. I I love the fact that he and Carol Locatell are both in this. Yes. Yeah. And I, I will say in the entire franchise, two of my favorite characters, right after Vera, of course, Armand Jr. Yeah, they are two of my all-time favorites, and I've told Ron this. I, I shared a story with him when I was 12 years old. We saw a new beginning at the theater, and mm-hmm. I had gone to the concessions. It was right when Junior's head was lopped off. I was coming back to the car. It was dark, and and I heard someone say Jason, and it scared the shit out of me. So I started running because, oh, my God, there's someone there's someone chasing me, and they're playing this Harry Manfredini score in the background, and I was terrified that someone was calling me. So I'm running and running in my sister's car, and I bang on the window, and I yell, let me in, let me in, there's somebody out here. So the window goes down slowly, and I, I look in, one of my son opens the door, and it's a complete stranger oh. looking at me like I was batshit crazy, and it was my sister calling me because I had passed her car. <laughs> so I told Ron that story, and he thought it was hilarious. How many of them have you seen in theaters? Like, I've seen a midnight screening of the original. I've seen mm-hmm. uh, Part 7 in the theater, and I've seen Jason X in the theater. I've seen Freddy vs. Jason and the reboot, mm-hmm. but all in theaters uh, mm-hmm. as of right now. How many have you seen in theaters? I have seen Part 5 was the first one I saw in the theater. Actually, that, that drive-in theater was the first time I saw any of them at the theater. And, it's, it's, and then after Part 5, I've seen all of them at the theater. Uh, Jason Lives holds the record of any. It's tied in fourth in, in fourth um, place for most movies seen at the theater ever. I saw it four times at the theater, which probably sounds kind of tame to other movie goers, goers but um, I actually saw part one at the theater for the first time last year. Mm-hmm. I, I, I was fortunate enough I got to spend the night with Adrian King. I watched it with her. Uh, we had wine and. I, um, when I say it's something some like that we really something like together, we were out there until six o'clock in the morning. I ended up buying a boat from her. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm trying to convince her to get that Crystal Lake wines here in Canada. Darn it! Oh, I have bought dozens of bottles of wine from her, and let me tell you, you like wine, you don't like wine. You gotta have her wine because it is it is amazing. Uh, wine lovers, I bought it as a gift for a wine lover, and he's just enthralled by her wines. He says they're one of the best he's ever had. Um, I'm not into dry wines. I like sweet. But she has one called the Chiller White and it was it was amazing. I can I could probably tip that bottle like a bagel pops. Yeah, she was my second interview guest since when I started this. And uh, mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I uh, I always again she's one of these ones I I had a crush on growing up, you know, from the franchise. Adrian's got a very down to law, uh, down to earth uh, appeal to her. She and, really does. Yeah, and I always found her attractive. Um, yes. I, I I can't convince her to wear the green overalls and the turtleneck. <laughs> Can you blame her? <laughs> I don't know what Can that was all her? about. <laughs> She doesn't. She doesn't well, like the fashion of the era. <laughs> she did not like that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and you know, and I actually have a photo that she signed for me. It has Alice's five-year-old rotted body at Jason's mother's uh, base of the table. And and I asked her because there was a lot of debate going on if that was Alice or not. You know, um, and she says no, that is not Alice. I said, can you put that in writing for me? So she put it on the picture. That that body is not Alice. Alice is, Alice is alive and well and drinking wine in the woods, and then she signed it. So, if anyone ever asks me what I think of that body being there, I I can firmly say no. That is not Alice. <laughs> that is someone else. I have it on good authority and in writing from Adrian King herself. It does and I have some... Adrian King over anyone. <laughs> it's got something stuck out of the side of its head. <laughs> it sure does. So all that means is that either Jason or Elias or whoever. You know, going back to Troy Theory, whoever killed the body that was in the shack, which wasn't Alice, used an ice pick, just like they legend believe, you know, uh, with Alice. But I think the whole beginning of part two was a dream. I like to think that because I don't like to think that Alice was killed. I loved Alice. So that's the only reason I, I like to think that wasn't her at the end. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Adrian, uh, it was fun to interview her. And, uh, yes. And, uh, what was that like? Was it just you and her watching the movie, or was there a bunch of you? No, like I said, we were at the we were at a theater. It oh, was, okay. It was pretty. It was pretty crowded. I do know when I she spoke about the movie, and they would pause it frequently throughout, and they would say little behind the scenes things to talk about the film. And um, she did tell me I I did we talked frequently back and forth on Messenger um, prior to this, and she was she said she was looking for me in the theater, and she was hoping that I was there. So that was. That was a really nice thing for her to say. She really took her time with the fans. After the movie, we got to line up and, and talk to her and, and have her give autographs and take pictures. I got a couple. I think I ended up with four pictures with her. Um, she gave me a free photo with an autograph on there, and she was very sweet. She was just so down to earth and very pleasant with her fans, and she took her time and didn't make it feel rushed. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, she had to be dead on her feet. And she, she never let up like she was. She was just as pleasant with the last customer, which was pretty much me, as mm -hmm. she was with the first customer. And, and I love her for it. She was just absolutely phenomenal. And I cannot wait to see her in 13 Fanboy. Yeah, hers is not shot yet, huh? No, not yet. Yeah. I and mean, it would have been fun to be back on set with her, too. But at least I did get to meet her in person. Yeah. Hope to do it again sometime. But it was I, I do have photos with her that I can reflect on and be like, I met Adrian. She was the first cast member on Franchise that I met in person. I haven't met any of them, <laughs> but I've yeah, interviewed was, a great. lot of them. <laughs> yes, I have to tell you. Um, I want to. I want to. Um, I can't forget this. This was such a, an important moment for me when I was in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. I had been talking to Deborah on the phone for a couple of years. Now we talk a lot, and let me tell you, we talk. We talk like old friends when we're on the phone. We have ninety minutes conversations hour long at a time it just goes by so quick and it's very common to finally meet her in person it goes so much beyond the moment with tracy or judy uh, we were staying at her cabin she put us up in her cabin um and it was it was phenomenal she had just bought the cabin that still had a 70s motif from the prior owner and, and i grew up in the cabin just like that so it was almost like being home as a kid again but she i opened the door and she was standing there and it's like it was I can't even describe it. It was an indescribable moment. I just, there's such a familiarity in her eyes. I watch her on video on Facebook and on interviews and, and, and to see her in person, you know, the beauty that you see on, on, on these videos can't even compare to real life. She looks, she was just stunning. And it was like, that's Deborah Voorhees. I'm finally meeting her. And that to me was a very profound moment. And, and not just seeing my friend for the first time, but uh, as being a, another castmate, a close and personal that was, very personal you know it was that was 
part of the whole reason I even went to New Mexico was was with the excitement of knowing I was going to finally get to meet her too. So that was a great moment. Yeah, I've had her on the show here four times, and I said to her on the last interview, I said, I know who the killers are. She said, killers? Uh-huh. Yeah, I said, it's those two dogs you get your picture taken with. It's them. And she goes, shh. <laughs> <laughs> Rosie's a cute little dog. <laughs> they're both cute. They're adorable. She sent me a picture of Rose, Rosebud when they first got her, and she was this cutest little little dog. Uh, yeah, your dogs are adorable. I said, those are the killers. <laughs> <laughs> those are the fanboys. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, D. Wallace has not been shot yet. Now, I've had her on the show uh, in 2015, but I had the pleasure of meeting her at Horrorama last year, and it was um, before. Uh, um, I don't know whether I mentioned 13 Fanboy to her or not, but mm-hmm. um, I don't recall. But I, I met her. I've got a picture with her from Horrorama, and she signed uh, my ET and uh, Howling uh, Blu-rays and. Uh, I just yeah. had a nice chat, and she remembered my interview from 2015. She said she got a good oh, response on that. Wonderful, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm honored that you're interviewing me. I mean, to be under interviewed by you, I was very honoring, and I was very, very flattered when you approached me. You know, and I I thank you now uh, for this also. But yeah, D. Wallace is incredible, and you mentioned the Halloween. That's one of my favorite D. Wallace films. Oh yes, absolutely. And there's a, a little hidden gem out there a lot of people don't know about called Popcorn. That was a fun film, too. What is it? It's a movie called Popcorn. Okay. Uh, it has Jill Sholin is in it. Uh, it's kind of like an old 50s movie being reshown at a theater, and uh, someone's, like, killing off the actors in real life, and Dee Wallace is in that. And um, She doesn't have a huge part, but her part was, was unforgettable. Uh Memory serves me correctly. She played Jill Sholin's mother. Okay. Which Jill Sholin's always been a favorite of mine too. She's just stunning. Mm-hmm. Stepfather. Stepfather was one of those movies I watched as a kid that it's become a staple in my collection. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, um, I am looking forward to Thirteen Fanboy, and of course, uh, oh, yeah. D. Wallace coming up to be filmed in this. Uh, because she's not mm-hmm. part of the Friday the 13th franchise, but Debbie Sue said she mm-hmm. wanted to work with her, and I don't blame yeah. her. <laughs> don't blame hey, her right. at all. Who could, blame, who could blame her? She hasn't done over 200 movies for no good reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love Dee Wallace. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is there anybody it's else? Phenomenal. Like, I don't know a lot of these names in the, the cast, but uh, is there any of them you want to highlight here that you want to mention in particular? Um. You know, I think I've talked about a lot of, a lot of people um, on the cast. Every single one of them was just superb in what they did mm-hmm. and the entire experience. Um, I made some great friends um, on the set. Uh, and Jennifer was, was so funny. Corey was so professional. Andrew and Vincent were, were both um, true gentlemen. Deborah was um, very articulate, and everything was planned out so superbly. Um, Judy was beautiful and Tracy was a dream come true to me. I just go on and on about the entire experience and everybody that was there. Um, there wasn't one person that I could say, you know, I wouldn't want to be around that person again. It was really a family on the set and it was just, it was a dream come true to actually be any part of it. So to get to wear all the hats that I've been given is, is in itself a dream come true as well. Well, I just got the 13 Fanboy t-shirt and tote bag in the mail, and I told Debbie when yeah. I go to Horrorama in Toronto, I am going to wear that thing and promote it there. I got it now because, well, it has Tom Matthews on it, and I wanted to get it while he was on there. Yeah, You know, it's funny. I wore my hat today. I went to the town hall, the, the, the city or city hall meeting today, and I had to go down there to, to speak up against somebody against discrimination in the workplace and I was in front of hundreds of people and I wore my 13 fanboy hat for strength. <laughs> oh yeah. So I'm up there on talking on a microphone about CEO discriminating against certain members and I had my 13 fanboy hat on. So I was like, I was in my, my zone. It was pretty cool. I wear it everywhere I go. Doesn't matter where I'm at or what I'm doing. I got my fanboy with me. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, I'm going to yeah. wear it. Uh, I go to, um, at the end of November, I go to Toronto for Horrorama, but I'm going to stay there for two weeks, you know. To, uh, it's my third trip there, but I really want to take the city in. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So um, who all did you pick up at the airport? I picked Benko and her father up one day. I picked up Haley. Okay. I ended up. I took I took Jennifer and her father back to the airport when they were getting ready to leave. I'm not a morning person, so they get up at 6 a.m. Typically, it would be difficult for me, but I knew I was going to get to spend a few more hours with Jennifer, and it was just like Christmas night. I couldn't sleep, you know, um, or Christmas Eve. I couldn't sleep because I, I was going to get to, you know, spend more time with her. It was awesome. So that was – I took them back to the airport. Um, I took one of the production assistants to the airport when he had to leave. Mm-hmm. So I made four airport runs, and it's – about 600 miles round trip, seven hour drive to do. And I did that four days in a row. Oh, wow. So I did, I did a lot of driving and, but you know, it was such a beautiful area. I had never been in the desert before. And it was literally 150 miles of just desert, no rest stops. <laughs> no, well, Michigan rest stops have bathrooms. New Mexico rest stops are just a fitness table. So, but it was it was very very beautiful. It was definitely something that I couldn't you couldn't possibly never get tired of driving that with the mountains and you know it was it was stunning. <laughs> so, uh, oh boy, I am looking forward to this being released. And uh, yeah. do you think this will be a hit? Oh yeah, I, there is not a single doubt in my mind. Um, like you said, the, the the legal war going on right now between Miller and Cunningham isn't leaving very many options for the fans. And this isn't just an, an answer to that. This is a love letter to the fans, and it really, it really is. Deborah has put together something so incredible. Um, I, I can't praise her enough. I just she was such an inspiration on the set. My last day there, I told her, I said, you know, you're doing something very important here, and it's going to be it's, it's going to be something that so many people are going to just cling to and she was such an inspiration i i would actually just love to learn how to drive just watching her was was a gift i mean I, there's so many words that i can't even begin to describe it well um oh gee what was i gonna say um oh yeah um Oh, gee, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> I do that all the time when I'm at work. Yeah, I had something I was going to say, and then I, I kind of lost me. But uh, Did it have to do with Victor and, and Cunningham? No, it, it did not. Um, oh, gee, ho- I hope it comes back to me. But anyway, yeah, I'm, the the release of the film, I'm, I won't be at the mm-hmm. premiere. I'm, I'm a little nervous about traveling to... Uh, the U.S. with everything going on right now. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I don't have a passport, but um, anyway, I, I, huh? I believe she's going to release it in other countries, too, so hopefully it'll come to Canada and, and you're, you'll be able to see it. You're, you're going to see it one way or another. Somehow, you're going to get your, your eyes on this movie. Hell yeah. You're, you're, you're going to see it on the big screen and you're going you're gonna to love every minute of it. Yeah, I hope to get it on Blu-ray. Oh, I know what I was going to ask. Here we go. Um, mm-hmm. Sure. Do you think there will be a sequel to it? Absolutely. It's already um, talked about it being a franchise. So, yeah, uh, I think it will definitely be at minimal a trilogy. Well, Troy Oichel mm-hmm. brought up something today. He mm-hmm. said, uh, is it going to all involve uh, Friday the 13th? Because it be, wouldn't make sense to call it 13th Fanboy if other franchises, uh... right, right, yeah, um, you know, in conversations with some of the filmmakers and Deborah herself, it, it's there's nothing solidified yet for the sequel. We know what's going to happen. We just don't know what it's going to be about. We know we've been trying different things, and nothing has really stuck yet. I think it, I think it really depends on the availability of the actors involved in all the different franchises and. The, the reception of the audiences and what they may say that they want and who might be involved in filming um, and the, the making of the second film. You know, all these things are probably going to come into play. I personally would think it would be fun to do different franchises, like maybe tie in a Nightmare on Elm Street or Halloween somehow. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't be disappointed no matter what they choose. And I, I can't sit here in line and say it wouldn't be super exciting to see 
more Friday the Thirteenth will them come on and do another movie, you know, with with it could be the same killer, different killer. I don't know the outcome of the killer in this one, so we'll have to wait and see. But it'll be it'll be exciting no matter what they do. And if we're getting a franchise, you know, it's gonna it's gonna kick ass no matter what they do. Well, you know, I hope they I hope she has Tom Matthews back for the second one and. And uh, I know that Nancy McLaughlin has told me that sh- she was interested, and I mentioned this to Deborah as well that uh, that Nancy would love to do this. So hopefully uh, she'll get her in the second one. That would be awesome. Actually, speaking of which, you know, you got mm-hmm. um, Ari LeMann and um, Tom McLaughlin both providing music to this film as well. Yeah. I know Ari, we got um, the first Jason is, is definitely uh, contributing mm-hmm. to the soundtrack. Um, it sounds awesome. I had no idea. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, I was talking to uh, Debbie Sue about this, and I interviewed Tom McLaughlin a second time. Uh, he, he came on for a second time this year, and he talked about it. So, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. It's interesting. I, I just love yeah. I love all the, the even the people from the franchise who may not be in the movie are still contributing in other ways. And I love how that it still ties them into it. Yes. Well you this know, look, that's awesome. Well, this looks good on the resume, I know that. Uh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like right now I've got an IMDB. I'm co producer on this. I cameo I'm associate producer in cameo and seven James Balsamo movies. Wonderful. Yeah, he's nice. some, yeah, he's somebody you might want to get really in touch cool. with. Yeah. Well, James Balsamo he has this thing where he goes around to all these conventions and he gets these named people to cameo in his movies. And he actually asked me if I would uh, cameo in one and because uh, he liked doing my show. Well, he's been on here a couple times. So uh, um, my the next one I'm in of his... My scenes. I just shot them here. I didn't even have to leave Fredericton. Um, but mm-hmm. they're going to be watched on a television by Eric Roberts. And I'm like, I'm in scenes with Eric Roberts, and I didn't even have to leave here. That is, that is that's too cool. That is, that's too cool. I've, I've been a fan of Eric Roberts for quite some time, too. Yeah. He, he's really cool. I think his his, his performance in Star 80 should, should have been nominated for an Academy Award. It was a total dark villain. Um, kind of role, but he was he was brilliant playing it. Star eighty, yes, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, his performance. I mean, he if that was the first movie you'd ever seen him, and you'd probably think he was really like that. Mm. Just how convincing he was. Yeah, no, and uh, another thing I, I too is that um, I had mentioned to uh, Debbie Sue, and of course Adam Marcus and his skeleton crew were on board with this. Um, mm-hmm. I, I said to Debbie Sue, I said, uh, do the uh, do the doubt fire face challenge for suicide and depression awareness. And, yeah, I uh, think that's a, that's fantastic, fantastic thing they've got going on. Yeah, well, I didn't start it, but it, it's something I kind of pushed. I had some of my guests do it, and one notable, uh-huh. of course, is Nancy McLaughlin. Speaking of Friday the Thirteenth, she does it right in front of props from Jason Lives. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm still very much in touch with Nancy, and um, she did it. And uh, and um, Adam Marcus and and Deborah Sullivan, a bunch of them are going to do it because um, I'm a heavy contributor on Hearts of Darkness. And I said to Debbie uh-huh. Sue, I said, I said, um, do the Doubtfire Face Challenge, you know. And and I threw it out to Adrian King, and and I think Adam Marcus is going to give her an extra nudge on that. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, that would be cool to get well, the hero under the hope, original. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. I, I would love. I hope Adrian and Deborah do that for you. That would be, a, that, and I would love to see it if, if they ever release that footage. I would love to watch that. Yeah, and <laughs> um, oh, um, and and, I, and when I was in Toronto last, of course, I'm good friends with Lisa Langwa from Class of 1984. Um, that mm-hmm. was my first trip in a plane, first trip out of New Brunswick, and. Uh, she invited me to assist her at this event. And um, last time I was up, I did the Doubtfire Face with Lisa, which was cool, you know. And I threw it out to the 13 fanboy people, and I mentioned, uh, I know I mentioned Tracy Savage because she was just kind of on my mind for the reason I got came on board with it, but I just kind of fired uh-huh. up some names. But, but um, 
but yeah, uh, Adam Marcus and, and uh, Deb Sullivan, the bunch of them are are uh, going to be part of that as well. So I like I did one originally, and it's kind of like you know nobody cares whether I do it. People want to see people no. in the industry do it, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but you know, if you bring awareness to it, you doing it yourself would be pretty pretty impactful and powerful on its own too. So don't yeah. underestimate that. Put a pie in your face. I challenge you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to do one and throw it out to them, you go for it. <laughs> I would totally throw it out to them. Yeah, absolutely. I could, I could pick three people to, to do it. I would love to see Jennifer Banco, actually. I, I think I think she would do it and her dad. I think they would both do it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. They, had, they had a great chemistry. Yeah. Who do you think all would do it out of that cast? Um, I think Haley would do it. I def I don't doubt. I can totally see Andrew Lady doing that. Um, Banco, Tracy and Judy. I don't know. Deborah. I don't know. Um, Pat. Some of the behind the scenes people, like um, there was a, a lovely woman named Pam Whitey, and Vanessa. I don't you right. Um, they're fabulous people i think they would both do it uh, and i would love to see both of them do it there were some um, other people who came out on the set for just a day um they would probably do it they were amazing people had a great time we played sushi roulette at a chinese restaurant um with them and that was an unforgettable, unforgettable experience i think a lot of people that were there that would do the challenge well, I've had Lisa Langwa's done it, um, Nancy McLaughlin's done it, Scotty McCoy, who wrote the uh, the Friday the 13th and Halloween's trivia books. He did it, and mm-hmm. he threw it out to a lot of Friday the 13th people, including Adrian, including Deborah, and um, including Lar Park Lincoln. <laughs> Lar's another one. I would love to see Lar do it. Yeah. She tore La- up that Nutella. I can't see why she wouldn't tear up a pie. <laughs> Well, she told me that she would nominate Kane Hodder because she said that uh, she can get yeah. Kane to do anything. I, you know, I could see Kane doing it with that that Jason expression on his face just to get the laugh. He was Kane. Kane was this big, hulking, um, massive man on set, but he was. I mean, I'm not gonna lie; he was intimidating to approach. Like, I didn't even introduce myself to him. I was afraid to talk to him for some reason. It's like, this guy said Jason. And then when I finally went up there, I'm like, can, can I take my picture with you? And I, I, the fan came out and the crew member went away. And he put his hand over my mouth like he was, you know, it kind of reminded me of uh, Stacey Grease in the part seven when okay. he put his hand over her mouth before he killed her. He did that with me. And I got a really cool picture with him doing that. And then, I thanked him and I went to walk away and he grabbed the back of my shirt and he pulled me back to him and he put his arm around me. He says, come on, let's do a really good picture, bud. And I was like, oh, this is the moment right here. This was, that was the moment of the day. So I got another <laughs> selfie with Kane Hodder when we were smiling and it was, it was, it was great. Yeah. Yeah. I and, went off track. <laughs> yeah. And most recently, Helen or Ellen, um, U- UD from My Bloody Valentine, she did one. Yes, did she? And that's one of my favorite films too. I love My Bloody Valentine. It's a staple. Yeah, and the um, original, of course, not the remake. Yeah, oh, I didn't but... see the remake, but uh, yeah, yeah. And James Valsamo, of course, did it because I was associate producer in a lot of his movies. And of course, this ends up costing me money. So I said, James, do the Doubtfire Challenge and just fire it out to some of the people that's worked on your films. And yeah, yeah. So well, you know, what? maybe I'll take you up on it. I'll do the dark pot dark. Without fire challenge and I'll, um, you know, I'll pick three people and I'll challenge them. I'll challenge one right now if she's listening, Vanessa. Vanessa, I own you, right? I challenge you. <laughs> you know somebody I'd love for you to challenge? Who's that? Tracy Savage. <laughs> Tracy Savage. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and throw it out, Jenna. You know huh? You know what's sad is um, she's commented on a few of my pictures and we got one great on set and everything. She's got uh, two Facebook accounts. Uh, one's Tracy Savage and one's Tracy W. Savage. Mm-hmm. And I've requested her friendship on both, and she has yet to accept. <laughs> and and there's people that were on the set that requested after I did that she's accepted. I'm thinking, did I say something wrong? We talked about Ann Arbor. <laughs> you know? I don't know. But I got I got 
several selfies with her. So, you know, she doesn't accept my friendship. I got that. <laughs> well, I'm on the Tracy Debbie Savage one. She, I think she told me that she reserves the other one more for family and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, then so. that makes that makes sense. Yep. Um, uh, total sense. Tamara Glenn, I believe, does that as well. She's she's a sweetheart too. She was from Halloween Five. She played Pam. Um, she's 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 a real sweetheart. I have a I have an autographed picture of her probably displayed in my karaoke cabinet of horror horror questions. <laughs> she's also in a Terrifier too. She just released that she's been cast in Terrifier too with Art the Clown. So that'll be fun to watch. You know what? Terrifier looks like an interesting movie, but I'm going to tell you the upside down split in half scene. I don't think I can watch that again. Yeah, that was unexpectedly brutal. And you know, I hadn't seen a scene in a movie like that since The Mutilator. Do you remember The Mutilator in the 83, 84? Um, I haven't um, seen it, but I know what one you're talking about. That's one of my favorites. Uh, actress named Connie Rogers played Sue uh, in the movie, and he ended up putting her on a workbench in the garage, and he puts his big gas between her legs, and you're thinking, oh, they're not going to show that. He won't actually do that. It'll be a cutaway. They show it. He puts it in between her legs. It comes out her stomach, and very graphic, and, and it was shocking. And uh, that scene in Terrifier kind of took me back to that to that moment that, that was that graphic. You know, it take a lot to make me say, holy shit, but that did it. Okay. <laughs> well, do you ever do the conventions? Uh, I've not been to a convention yet. Um, I, Other than meeting Adrian in person at that event, I haven't really done any. Motor City Nightmares comes around every year. I had actually planned on going to it two years ago with a friend, but her father got sick, and I felt too guilty to go without her, so I didn't go. Um, Heather Langen Camp and Linda Blair were there that year, mm -hmm. and I would have loved to have called up or to go, and I was tempted. I mean, I had five hundred dollars set aside just to blow there, and I and I and I ended up not going. The mm -hmm. following year, Heather Langen Camp was back again. I had a friend there. Uh, Heather was gracious enough to offer um, offer to do a video Facebook um, video chat with me. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up getting an autographed photo of Heather Langen Camp that she personalized for me. She wrote what I wanted. It says. Jason, I'll see you in your dreams, Heather Rain Camp. And, uh, she's another one I had a crush on when I was 12 years old, um, watching just a ton of us and Nightmare 3 and the new Nightmare. It's like, she's just, she demands your your attention because she's just so stunning to look at. Yeah. Well, I haven't had very many Elm Street people on the show. Lisa Wilcox has been on and Ira Hyden, mm -hmm. you know. Um, mm -hmm. From that original, I've had Amanda Wiss on with Tommy yeah. Hudson to talk about the id, but I haven't been able to get her back on. So, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, so That's who awesome. knows? So who knows? You know, but yeah. um, I will, I will, I will get to say I will finally get to meet Heather Lane Camp in person in February. Um, I'll be uh, working alongside her at a Women in Horror Film Festival, and um, she's gonna be on the celebrity guest. And I'll be, I'm also a, a judge there. I'll be working the crowd with questions with the filmmakers and the audience. And Heather will be there. So I'll get to meet Heather and talk to Heather. And that, that, that's, that's something I'm really looking forward to. That will be exciting. Oh, wow. Who else is going to be at that? Um, Marianne Madalena, who is also a producer on the Nightmare on Elm Street um, franchise, will be there. Okay. Um, you know, I, I have the list of names somewhere else i don't i don't really okay. that come to mind right now it's just a, it's a really great list of celebrity panel um i, I remember marianne and, and heather because you know i've i've known of their names for so long they're, they're kind of hard for me to forget well you know we haven't talked about any of the other films that you're involved in because the badge the gun mm -hmm. and the hangman's news i've i've talked yeah. to tom matthews about that so you're you did get to be in a film with tom matthews I will, yes. Next next year we'll be we're set to shoot the the badge gun and the hangman the news. So I play the hangman, the executioner, um, and it, I will get to uh, finally work with Tom. So that will that will happen. Uh, so I'm I'm excited about that. Um, the, um, uh, Vincent Desanti and Andrew Lighty from Thirteen Fanboy are coming back. Um, uh, Vincent Gastavano. Yes, yeah, so I was going to mention him. He's yeah. in it. Dot, uh, where the red dot goes, you bang. He's, <laughs> he's going to be in it. This is kind of like a horror crossover into the Western genre. It's, and it's going to be really fun. 
Um, Vanessa Vanessa Wright is is writing this as co-writing this movie and she's directing it. Um, forgive me if I get the name wrong. I'm not looking at notes, but I believe Edward Santiago uh, is the, is the author, the original writer of of, the, of it. And Nora um, Nora Hewitt's doing the uh, effects. Nora Hewitt, yeah, she's back. I'll get to work with Nora again. Yeah, I'm excited about that. She's she's phenomenal. Uh, yeah, really excited to get to know um, that Laura's going to be there. Um, there's another production assistant uh, slash cast member that was a 13 fanboy named Rick Sarah. He'll also be there. He's playing playing a character. Um, so there's a lot of 13 fanboy uh, alumni crossing over to to this this film as well. Friday 13 uh, actors. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be really fun. There's a lot of things in the works that uh, Vanessa Wright is doing, and, and I'm just very honored to be a part of any of them in any way I can be. So it's it's just, yeah, it's very thrilling. And there's Son of the Wolf, which is directed by Joel Paul Rising, who is Son of uh, the Wolf. I yes, I was on set for Son of the Wolf um, uh, as as an extra. So I, that was the first time I met Joel. I believe that was March of this year. Uh, we went down there and spent the day. I learned the lesson to never wear leather boots in 30 degree weather because there's no insulation. And after 12 hours, you don't feel your feet. <laughs> You're just standing up and balance yourself uh, by instinct. <laughs> um, but that was fun. Uh, that was the second film that I was a part of, uh, and I and I learned a, and I learned a lot of the process of that one with like reversing and setting up and and doing all these shots from different angles and having animals on the set that was that was a great just so you know some of the wolf is not cgi wolves they're actual wolves being used and they were beautiful beautiful animals and they were so loved and, and well taken care of it's just it's going to be it's going to be great to see this and i believe the film just wrapped um it'll do that or he's, he's got another movie called fourth camp three that maybe the one i'm thinking about that just wrapped but he joel did wrap on one of his films just very recently he may have been horse camp three Okay. Wow. Do you yeah. have uh, any charities that you're involved in? Um, I, I don't have any charities I'm involved in, per se, but I do I do love the uh, St. Jude's charity. Okay. And um, there's another charity. Oh, my God, I can't remember the name. I don't know why I can't remember the name. I've chopped my hair off for them, and I've donated hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and I can't recall them. Oh, forgive me. It's it's a it's a children's charity for children with cancer. Okay. Um, I do I do I do that quite frequently. Uh, if, if I get the chance to look it up, hopefully you can put it in the description because I would love to put a link. But um, I can remember on Friday the Thirteenth after, but I can't remember an important charity. How horrible am I? <laughs> do you have a web page um, that? Huh? Yeah, I I have I I can find the web page and everything. Um, that's something that I I, I love to contribute to. Like I said, I've shave my head bald for them just to bring awareness uh, mm-hmm. to them and, and did some fundraising for them. And it was, it's just a, it's a very, very uh, important thing to me. I just, uh, the health of children is something that as a father, I have a 21 year old daughter and I'm thankful every day that she's healthy. And then it just, it scares me to think what, what could be, you know, and, and there are parents out there who live that nightmare and, and anything you can do to help um, have, give them a happy ending or even find strength in their, their suffering, you know, even if, whether it be through faith or, or support, it's just, it's always just an important thing to be able to, to be able to do that. Do you have your own web page that, uh, that you've, you've got or just your social media? No, just my social media, just my Facebook. I'm not, well, I'm not, I'm not, uh, <laughs> and I don't know if I will be, I'm not really that big of an actor, but you know, I, I don't think I'll ever be, big enough to have my own my own web page maybe someday we'll see we'll see um what direction it goes into none of the stuff happening to me now was ever ever really planned um i on the set of 13 femboy what i didn't expect was to meet so many incredible filmmakers and people in the industry and and building a friendship with them and coming away with offers um you know I, i've mentioned vanessa she's the one doing the the badge the gun and the hangman's news i was speaking with her on the phone outside my workplace one day and, and she just pitched some incredible ideas about some of her films. And, and it's, you know, and I told Deborah today, I said, you know, I, I didn't expect any of this stuff to happen. All this uh, other stuff that I've been coming away with. You know, I thought I was just going to go film my scene and help on the set. 
and that was going to be the end of it. So all this, like, talking to you right now, it's, it's just it's part of something that I didn't expect, and it's been an incredible journey. Okay, what kind of merchandise do you have from Friday the 13th, especially autographs? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh. <laughs> I have I have a six-foot, two-inch life-size Jason, the worship broker Jason statue in my living room front well, I wouldn't say center, but it's very very prominently displayed right by my door. Whenever my daughter would come over, she would remove Jason's head and place it on the dining room table, and I asked her why she why she did that. And she said, because he scares me. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought the head on the dining room table doesn't freak you out. <laughs> but um, I have an entire eight-foot curio cabinet just filled with stuff from Adrian King's autographs. You know, one of my favorite things that I've collected is a Baltic Avenue Monopoly board <laughs> game piece that Adrian wrote. I think it's a pretty color, and then she signed it. And she told me, I don't know if she's done any more since then, but she did tell me this earlier last year. That was the first one of those that she's ever signed. So as far as I know, I have the only one right now in the world. Um, and if she did sign another one since, I have the first one that she ever signed in the world. So either way, that's pretty exciting. Yes! Wow. <laughs> yeah, I have I have a camera. Oh, sorry, we're on the Friday thirteenth. I have Melanie Kinnaman, who uh, personalized a photo for me, uh, autographed a photo for me. Mm -hmm. um, the barn scene of the New Beginning, which she's got the chainsaw. Yeah, and she sent uh, she sent me a couple of autograph pictures too. I've had Melanie on a couple of times. She's yeah, lovely. Yeah. yeah. It's, you know, part five is very underrated. So to have something signed by Melanie it, it was it was a thrill to be able to to put that in my collection I have a I have a personal I like personal a lot of people don't like personal life things I want my name on it mm -hmm. I'm not going to sell it I'm going to keep it until I die so I like my name on it um I have a personalized photo uh Ron Sloan signed for me it same. says my mom was going to chop you up into itty bitty pieces my friend same here I've got his as well <laughs> yeah yeah um I would love something from Carol Locatel. Uh, I've got a few things from Deborah Voorhees. Center center shelf in my collection is a personal letter that she wrote me and signed um, pretty early on in our friendship. That's become my favorite piece, and it's it's displayed center shelf in the front. Mm -hmm. um, I've got all the available NECA, NECA Jasons um, displayed out of their boxes. Sorry, collectors, if that bothers you, but I, I like to enjoy them. <laughs> the only one I don't have is the NES. Um, I will get that one of these days, but I've got I've got some Never Hike Alone posters. Yep. Um, you know, I definitely consider that part of that franchise. Uh, and I, I consider it canon, as, to, to be quite frank with you. I think it's very important to the franchise and the story. But, um, I've got uh, a lot of uh, autographed pictures from people in the franchise, you know. But yeah. uh, one thing I got recently, Ted White sent me a replica of a hockey mask he wore in oh, uh, part awesome. four. And he signed it, and I thought that was cool. I offered to pay for it too, but he said no. Yeah. He said he he loved doing the show, and he was happy to do it. And I was like, what a gracious, generous individual. Right. Well, that's you know you know what I did. I was um, on set. We were filming. Kane Hodder was eating his spaghetti, mm -hmm. and Vanessa came up to me. And I had my wallet out, and I had a Friday the Thirteenth wallet. I have tons of books. Of course, I have the memories of. Crystal Lake and all, you know. Yep. And I have a wallet. It was a, it's a Friday the 13th leather wallet. And Vanessa was like, oh, my God, let me ask Kane how to find that for you. <laughs> and I told her no. And she said, why? I said, because I'll never be able to use this wallet again. I'll be afraid it'll be damaged. So I didn't get the autograph. And I'm driving home. I'm thinking, why the hell didn't I let him sign it? I could have bought a different wallet. <laughs> yeah. Something in hindsight, I'm thinking, why the hell didn't I let Kane like, how to sign that wallet? Um, so I could have had that, but I blew my chance on that. So. Are you going to the premiere? Uh, no, I, I won't be going to the premiere. Um, not not on California, anyways. When they have, but I will definitely be seeing it opening night. Probably the first ticket, but will be myself. And I'm debating: Do I want to see it alone in the theater the first time I watch it, or with a crowd of people? I would kind of love to sit back, relax, and enjoy every moment of it without any interruptions and just take it all in before I see it with someone so I can enjoy it by myself first so I don't miss anything. But then again, that first time would be unforgettable with a crowd of people that I'm with, you know, and just shouting and enjoying every minute of it. So I don't, I'm torn on which way to do it, but 
I know I'm going to say it more than once. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, here's my last question. When you did your scene with Tracy, did you see my picture? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I didn't see your picture. My daughter's picture is also prominently displayed in that scene, so I don't know all the other photos. My my sight just seems to go right to my, my kid, <laughs> you know, so... Um, I did not, but do you know where it was? And I also was not there the day that that was filmed, so I didn't get to see the set. Um, okay. Well, tra- uh, Tracy definitely. Run. Yeah, Tracy definitely said it was there. <laughs> told- okay, fantastic. Yep, I wanted fantastic. I wanted it in a scene with Tracy Savage, so. Yeah, yeah, she she was the. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, it was. I, she makes me speechless. Yeah, same here. Yes. Well, you know what? You say that that was the first thing that Adrian King signed for you, the Baltic Avenue piece. Well, I'm uh-huh. honored that I'm the first person to interview you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm very honored to be here. Yes, it's a, it's very exciting, and yeah, it's you giving me something very special, and I thank you for it. You know what? It was a lot of fun. You know, we have uh, it was yeah. Absolutely. We're both these between you and I. This is just kind of something that happened, and we're a part of it, and it, it just feels great. And even if we don't make it to the yeah. premiere, it's we're still part of this, you know? We are still a part of it, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. It is. It's, it's phenomenal. You know, it's weird. You you love the horror community, the genre, the franchise, everything. You spend your whole life giving all this energy to it, never expecting that one day that horror genre and everyone behind it and who's a part of it is going to turn around and... Thank you. Absolutely. It, you know, and that's pretty much what Deborah's given us the 13th Envoy. It's a huge thank you. Absolutely. And personally, it's I, and I take that as a thank you. And you know what? I like to tell Deborah and all the actors and everyone involved in the filmmakers and of the Friday 13th franchise and of the horror community and just a great big huge. You are more than welcome. <laughs> you know? A big thank, thank you. Thank for you. making it so fun to love. Yes, a big thank you to Debbie Sue Voorhees and yeah. uh, the cast and crew of 13 Fanboy and the, allowing uh, Jason Bradford and myself to be part of this, you know. It's an honor. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, it's an honor. Well, you know what? Before I let you go, would you mm-hmm. mind doing a plug for my show? Oh, absolutely. This is Jason Bradford, and you've been listening to Greg Gilbert. Python's Paradise, New Brunswick, Canada. And you know what? When you get some other projects under your belt, you're more than welcome to come back on. Oh, absolutely. I would love to. It's been very thrilling. And like I said, I do have a few few projects lined up in the next couple of years. I have a few of them, so uh, hopefully we can definitely be in touch. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know what? Thank you so much uh, for coming on here today. I'm glad that I'm your first interview. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. You have yourself a wonderful night. Great. Thank you. You too, Greg. Yep. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye.